So hello everyone and welcome. I am Yağmur Civan Uyanık and I am the administrative assistant at Koç University's Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, also known as Anamed. Thank you for taking time out and being here today for the first talk of this academic year's Anamed talk series. The title of the talk is Center and Periphery, Mobility and Climate Change in the Forgotten Bronze Age Kingdom of Mukesh, Atay, Turkey. Today's speakers are former Anamed Fellow Murat Akar, current Anamed Fellow Tara Inkman, and Ula Shavshar from Middle East Technical University Geological Engineering Department, and our moderator will be Rana Özbal. A Q&A session will follow the talk. You are more than welcome to write your questions into the Q&A box throughout the event. Before I leave the floor to Professor Rana, today's moderator, I would like to briefly introduce her to you. Professor Rana Özbal returned to Turkey in 2006 after receiving her BA and PhD from Bates College and Northwestern University respectively. Following a brief period of instructorship at Boğaziçi University and a postdoctoral fellowship at Istanbul University, Özbal began as a department member at the Archaeology and History of the Art Department at Koç University in 2010, where she becomes, uh, became a work docent in uh, 2014 and an associate professor in 2018. Özbal has worked extensively in Hatay on the Chalcolithic in, of the Amuk Valley through excavations at the 5th and 6th millennium site of Telkurdu and through field surveys in the plain in general. Mm. She has also spent over a decade researching the 7th millennium of Nest Northwest uh, Anatolia, working in Bursa at Barjanhöyük, where she was the project co-director. Özbal's research focuses on spatial reconstructions of households and communities by trying to understand the use of space through sediment geochemical analysis and microarchaeological methods. She has also been collaborating with, with researchers using archaeometric techniques useful when interpreting um, archaeological sites and ancient communities they housed, including lipid residue studies, as, as well as uh, mineralogical elements and isotopic analysis. Özbal has received an award uh, for excellence in teaching at Koç University, where she continues to teach both undergraduate and graduate courses for students in, the, uh, in her department and beyond. Lastly, I would like to inform you that the microphones and videos of all attendees are turned off automatically and that this event will be uh, recorded. Uh, have a nice, uh, wonderful webinar. So uh, thank you very much for this introduction, uh, Yamur Hanım. Uh, what I'd like to do first is to introdu introduce the, the speakers to you uh, and um, the way in which the, the format will be uh, for this um, webinar uh, will be presentations uh, by each of our speakers. Uh, followed later by a question and answer uh, session. And uh, as Yamur Hanım mentioned, you are welcome to write your questions uh, at any point and we'll try to find time at the end, hopefully to be able to answer them. So let me first introduce each of the speakers to you briefly. Uh, I'll start with uh, Murat Akar. Uh, Murat Akar is currently an associate professor at Mustafa Kemal University in Hatay, uh, where he's been employed since 2016. And he has degrees uh, from Bilkan's uh, Archaeology and History of Art Department and Metu Settlement Archaeology Program, where he uh, received his BA and MSc, respectively. For his doctoral work, he went to the University of Florence uh, in Italy and received his degree from the Near Eastern Archaeology Department there. He's been a former Anamed Fellow, as Yalbur Hanım already said, and has worked in the Archaeology and History of Art Department at Koç University. Uh, he's now uh, the director of the Amukrad Valley Regional uh, Survey Project, also uh, the uh, director of the excavations uh, at uh, Tel Achana, Alalah. He's also the uh, scientific advisor to the uh, research rescue excavations at uh, Toprakisar Huyuk, which is run officially by the Hatay Archaeological Museum. And I think we're going to get a mix of uh, uh, all these things in our, our, our uh, the presentations we'll be hearing today. 
Uh, his research in uh, areas include architecture, memory, and landscape studies, particularly for the second millennium BC of Anatolia, the Near East, and the Levant. And his current research, um, which is also uh, very much influenced by the Tubitak project you'll be hearing about today. The Tubitak project is called Geological and Archaeological Traces of Climatic Changes in the Amuk Valley of Hatay during the Holocene. And this current research addresses so the role of climate in the long durée for understanding the continuously shifting uh, population dynamics and cross-cultural en encounters in the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, before I um, uh, you know, give him the floor so he can begin his presentation, allow me to uh, introduce the other speakers uh, today. Uh, I'll uh, continue with Tara. She's sort of next on my uh, screen. So uh, Tara received her uh, BA uh, in anthropology and philosophy from New York University, and her MA and PhD both from the Archaeology and History of Art Department of Coach University. And she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Anamet at uh, Coach University's uh, Research Center for Anatolian Civilization. She um, continues to uh, work as the assistant director for publications of Tel uh, the Alalah excavations. Uh, and she's also the senior uh, field supervisor uh, for um, in charge of the area one excavations during uh, including sort of both the, the middle and the late bronze age levels uh, 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 at the site of Alalah. Her research focuses on the scientific and anthropological study of burial practices at Tel Achana and how the intersection between various types of bioarchaeological bio studies, such as isotopic analyses and ancient DNA analyses and choices made uh, during um, the burial of the dead can shed light on issues of both individual and group identity and also questions of mobility. Uh, so it's exciting. We're gonna be hearing new results of some new research here today. Uh, and finally, allow me to um, introduce our, our final uh, speaker today, Ulash Avshar, uh, now employed as an associate professor at Metu's Department of Geological Engineering uh, since I think 2017. Uh, he obtained his doctoral degree in the University of Ghent after receiving both his um, BSc and MSc at Metu. Uh, his main area of research has been uh, sedimentary records of past, past climates, earthquakes and tsunamis. And uh, of course, now he's doing all sorts of relationships with uh, human impact and uh, these things which we'll be hearing about. His PhD research has focused on uh, sedimentary traces of paths, earthquakes, and he's done extensive research studying lakes located on the North Anatolian uh, fault line. Uh, but his doctoral research applying these same techniques on these fault lines to um, in Iceland, giving him experience in other geographies as well. Later on, he was granted a prestigious Muddy Curie grant to investigate the sedimentary rocks of historical Eastern Mediterranean tsunamis in lagoons associated or located along the southern coast of Turkey. These questions and his training uh, in reading sedimentological records made him an ideal candidate to become the director of geological research in the Amuk Valley. And he has recently focused his efforts towards your archeological investigations of past climate human interactions uh, within the scope of the same uh, Tubitak project I just mentioned, geological and archeological traces of climatic changes in the Amuk Valley during the Holocene. So uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, excited to be able to invite our first speaker, Murat Akar. Uh, please, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen, Murat. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think I'll turn my microphone off. Let's see if it works. Great, we're able to see your screen. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. That's all great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want this event to be visually appearing to express ourselves at best. So uh, I'm here right now at uh, Telechana, Allah Excavation Storage Depot. So it's going to be a nice visually appealing background. But uh, because we are in a village and because there are noises in the background, I will try to be as loud as possible uh, to suppress this uh, noises of the village life. So dear colleagues, friends and fellows who joined to this event from all over the world, it is a pleasure and honor to be invited to the first Anamet talk of this semester 
which will outreach to a wide audience through online streaming platforms, but hopefully will also create the opportunity for missed social gatherings, at least in Istanbul, perhaps at the rooftop of Anemet. In 2014, when I was a fellow, not only I had the excellent research experience, but uh, I was also lucky to create an exhibition with my colleague, Helene Malavanya. Including the unpublished photographs from 1930s excavation to my personal experience as a photographer, the exhibition provided an artistic, nostalgic, and perhaps a sentimental view of the research that we have been conducting at Alala, the capital city of the territorial second millennium BC kingdom of Mukish. This wonderful experience had an important outcome with the publication of the exhibition catalog, The Forgotten Kingdom, Archaeology and Photography at Ancient Alala. The second in series of the three books published by Koch University Press. So I thank to Animet for providing the wonderful research environment and cooperation opportunities in time. And I wish the same for the fellows of this year based in Istanbul. The Amuk Valley of Hatay as the core territory of the Kingdom of Mukish from an archeological standpoint is an impact zone borderland for the Eastern Mediterranean Near Eastern and Anatolian counterparts. From the point of archaeological field practice, it is a research project conducted along the thin red line, the Turkish Syrian border, thus, witnessing to every stage of civil war in Syria. Emphasized in this photo from our Anamet exhibition, the plastic canisters used for diesel smuggling by then were part of our daily scenery and certainly not being the only commodity of illegal operations. Now a drive through the modern landscape would give the experience of a vast open space divided into, and bordered by, divided into grids and bordered by mountains in the far horizon. Tal sites are weighty elevated landmarks, at least in the eyes of an archeologist or an enthusiastic traveler. This landscape is sharply defined by the construction of a concrete wall along the Turkish Syrian border as part of the extreme measurements taken for security purposes. In fact, switching from crop dusters to drones, we are operating now our daily flights in manual mode since jammers are blocking our GPS signals. Flights to capture aerial views just like this, I would say is a nightmare. Today, our talk will exclusively be focused on the second millennium BC through several interconnected projects, providing a view from the politically, socially, and economically entangled, centered, and relatively unknown periphery. Following my introduction on our multi-proxy archeological data collection and research strategies, Tara Igman will continue with the regional mobility patterns through a view from the human remains. Ulaş Avşar will explore the essential steps taken forward in constructing a region-wide geoarchaeological research program that focused on implementing new sedimentary coring strategies from a comprehensive understanding of the dynamics between changing climate and human activity in the region. There cannot be any other perfect candidate for such a comprehensive research program since the Amuk Valley of Hatay has not only been a region of rich ecological potential, but a buffer and an impact zone. Traces of cultural, economic, and political interactions from stages of chiefdoms to city-states and then to kingdoms and empires are uncovered thanks to contributions from numerous scholars, including our moderator, Rana Özbal, with her outstanding research on the calculitic of the region through Tel Kurdo. This statement found its roots in the pioneering archeological surveys conducted by Robert Braidwood, setting the foundations of the archeological research in the Amok Valley, and was bolstered uh, through 1930s excavations conducted at the Bronze Age capital, located roughly 20 kilometers east of modern Antakya. With an agenda to define the early interactions between 
Western and Eastern civilizations, Felichana was targeted by British archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley, where he successfully revealed the second millennium BC sequence, providing archaeological and textual anchorages to kingdom of Mukish and its capital city. I quote the Times, although its name suggests something fantastic, an orientalist fascist war cry or a Russian ballad, Alala was a real Hittite city of which archaeologists and historians will have a great deal to say. At the neighboring Taltaina, the University of Chicago's Syria Hittite expedition explored the lesser known third millennium BC dynamics and revealed a stratigraphic sequence with Neo-Hittite and Neo-Assyrian levels, providing references to ancient city of Kunulua, the capital city of the recently defined kingdom of Valasatin and then Unki Patina in the Iron Age. Following a century break, the region was retargeted for extensive research under the direction of Kutla Aslahan Yener, where multidisciplinary research strategies targeting the exploration of environmental and anthropogenic factors accelerated the data flow from the Amuk Valley. The application of a strong archaeological science practice during excavations, including the establishment of sampling strategies from absolute dating methods to production technologies or genomic research. The current state of our multidisciplinary research program holds to a broad range of research questions and specialists. This certainly owes to her vision of archaeological practice in Turkey. Over the last 20 years, supported by Turkish Ministry of Culture and Fund for Amuk Valley Excavations, and evolving from the village garbage dump to Tel Achana Excavations and Amuk Valley Research Center, it now acts as a hub for multiple projects, exploring region's history and supporting the growth of a new generation of archeologists. The Depot State of the Art Organization, where I am currently based now, an open access policy proudly provides an exemplary model for archeological data storage, as all these projects follow a no discard policy. Moving from the history of archeological research to archeological results, the Amuk Valley and the neighboring regions show signs of reurbanization in the beginning of the second millennium BC as a supra-regional phenomenon extending along the borders of the Orontes, Euphrates and Tigris river systems and Halicin Basin, Middle Bronze Age is marked by monumental scale construction programs reflecting the complexity issue in the use of space and the symbolic presentation uh, of the prestige and power of autonomous cities and kingdoms. This was best observed at Ala through 1930s excavations, yielding a continuous Middle Bronze Age occupation defined by level seven palace complex and the tripartite monumental gateway commonly accepted to be destroyed by the Hittite king Atushili I. Nevertheless, Alala, the capital city of the kingdom of Mukish, was never a primary leader in the time of great powers, but it was subservient to the kingdom of Yamhat, based at Aleppo in the Middle Bronze Age, then to Mitanni during Idrimi's dynasty. This is not only epigraphically stated through the autobiographic inscriptions on the statue of King Idrimi, but also with the construction of a palace complex that constitutes a castle, serving units, residential and administrative quarters. Being likely the victim of another Hittite attack at the end of 15th century BC, this building can be regarded as an important step in the history of architecture. Due its columned and stepped entrance, representing one of the earliest type Bitilani in the region. The site is now open to visits as an archeological park, a challenge by itself to be discussed in another event, since it gets harder and harder, not only to excavate in deep soundings, but also to preserve or preserve the unburned fragile mud brick architecture. Nevertheless, the site now allows for visitors to get a better understanding of a Bronze Age capital city and how was the royal life at Alala under the sovereignty of Mitannian Empire. 
the destruction of this historical monument was followed by the strong presence of Hittites during the reign of Shupilima I and Murshidi II in the second half of the 14th century BC. As a reflection of their imperial policies, monumental mud brick fortresses transformed the site into a military base and at the same time added perhaps kilotons of weight to the whole settlement. This photograph taken a few weeks ago captures the cleaning of a collapse section constituting four meters of a mud brick masonry that belongs to the foundation platform of the Northern Fortress. Thus being modest in scale, but yielding well-preserved architecture and finest examples of locally produced and imported products, Alala reflected its strategic importance. But beginning of this urban expansion period remain in need of further exploration. Our uh, new excavations in deep Middle Bronze Age soundings will provide a detailed overview of the earlier time periods. The earliest textual data from Tel Achana comes from Level 7 Palace complex, revealing the name of the city as Alala. Yet the earliest textual references targeting the region is coming from Ebla, Early Bronze Age Palace G archives, mentioning a city of Alalahu suggesting perhaps the name was physically georeferenced to Tel Tainat, where the late third millennium BC sequence was encountered. The recent discovery of Iron Age levels at Tel Achana and multiple riverbed channels of Orontes confirmed through sedimentary cores suggested that the temporal shifts observed between two locations from third millennium to the first millennium BC. This created a multi-proxy city which developed according to its water ecology. Therefore, the larger cityscape of Telachana and Peltainat should then be seen as part of a multi-layered megacity shaped by the Orontes River. The availability of archaeological data corresponding to time periods when major climatic fluctuations occurred, the 4.2K and 3.2K BP events from Telachana, Teltainat, and also now fresh data from brand new excavations at Topraki Serhuyuk, which I will discuss in a moment, altogether combined provides the opportunity to correlate paleoclimate and archeological data from the very same geographical setting. But environmental determinism as an approach oversee climate as an enforcer shaping survival and resilience strategies. However, from subsistence to formation of complex social and economic systems, the human environment interaction creates bonds and forms functional and symbolic entanglements. This bond should be regarded as a catalyst for urbanization and sophistication of complex technologies, as well as for, for formation of metaphysical notions. However, since many times a region is only explored through its major sites, the research questions like mobility patterns or the impact of climate change is often only explored from single-sided perspectives, the center. This excludes how societies react as a complex whole. The archeological research on Bronze Age in the Amu Valley of Hatay has now been strengthened by the research rescue excavations conducted in the Altanese Highlands at the peripheral site of Toprakisar Hüyük, providing the opportunity to reveal center and periphery relations. This allows contextualization of the often theoretically discussed tired hierarchical systems and the textual records or the role the hinterland played in territorial kingdoms in the process of empire building strategies. Today, the hills around Toprakisaruyuk are covered with naturally grown and cultivated olive trees and the business of olive oil constitutes the main source of income for the region. Now lost, the region served also as an important location for viticulture in antiquity. Toprek Saruk is a small scale hillside settlement that is severely damaged by the village on top and the construction of the Yar City Dam. The small scale site, although, has now began to reveal what we are missing from the Amuk, the stratigraphic sequence with almost no gap or temporal shifts 
unlike the case of Telechana or Teltainat. The preliminary extensive surface surveys revealed material evidence that the site was continuously occupied from 6th millennium BC to the first half of the 1st millennium BC. Excavations revealed surprisingly and unexpectedly the well-preserved remains of a burnt Middle Bronze Age building complex consisting of narrow buttressed corridor type rooms and courtyards revealing a large cache of uh, utilitarian objects used in food preparation, serving, and storage. This also included decorated horseshoe-shaped parts related to large-scale cooking well beyond the needs of a single household. The building was destroyed by a burning event, sealing its contents in situ. Its spatial arrangement and the similarities observed to palatial structures from neighboring sites has been contextualized within the regional style in palatial and administrative architectural customs. But perhaps one of the most distinctive aspects of Toprakisar is the hearts with decoration to their frontal faces. Decorated hearts are not known from any Middle or Late Bronze Age context at, at, at Telachana. This decorated tra tradition, on the contrary, seemed to be well appreciated at Toprakisar. In this respect, Individuals involved in the act of making hearts or cookings seem to have developed strong bonds with the objects that they produced in periphery. Also, the objects found in foundation rituals of the same building not only signified the symbolic importance of the structure, but presented further clues on long distance cultural interaction and mobility patterns. Generally defines as stone spirits, the crudeness of the style attested is identical to late bronze examples from Telachana. These were also carved in a worshipping posture, but were associated with later Huromitanian levels at the site. No earlier examples are known from Telachana. On the other hand, Toprak historic examples from early Middle Bronze Age contexts may indicate that the practice of placing carved figurines as votive offerings or as protective spiritual guardians was non-local to Amuk before and perhaps may signal a nomadic pastoralist identity in its origin. The relationship between the globally traced 4.2 KBP climatic events and the archeologically not well-traced population movements is a controversial topic and highly debated. Harvey Weiss suggested that this event created arid environmental conditions, especially in northern Mesopotamia, a catalyst behind nomadization of diverse groups such as the Amorites or Hurrians to more favorable and climatically less stressed regions. Due its karstic nature, the Orontes River and its catchment area is defined as one of the habitat tracking zones. This environmental issue in prompting long distance mobility may reasonably be seen as one of the triggers behind the appearance of stone spirits or the decorated horseshoe shaped parts identical to Tigris and Euphrates examples since ritual paraphernalia or ways of cooking are regarded as distinct markers for defining culturally and traditionally distinguished groups. Further evidence contributing to the unity and originality of the cults and rituals of Syria Anatolian communities are now further explored in a forthcoming article showing how much a peripheral site can add to our understanding of Bronze Age dynamics. But much of our understanding of ritual practices in the Near East is coming from Tal sites, yet the interaction between human and their surrounding landscape extends beyond the living spaces. Thus being said, I would like to take you to our final location, the hilly ritual landscape of Mukish, and particularly to Kızılkaya rock outcrop. Kızılkaya is located along the narrow passageway that connects the Amuk to Islaye Plain on the north and to Afrin Valley on the east. Over hundreds of dolmens were found along this five kilometer rock outcrop. Whether used as cenotaphs, gateways to celestial world, or actual burial grounds, the remnants of the cultic activity 
define its symbolic value, at least from late Calculitic onwards. Previously defined, surveyed and defined as a megalithic structure, a building of rectangular shape stood on the southern summit of Kizilkaya. A high resolution drawn mapping was followed by magnetometry survey thanks to Rana Özbal and Foke Gerritsen in 2019, revealing how the structure was incorporated into terrain resembling the high top quarters at perhaps Hattusha. Also clearly visible in digital elevation models superimposed, the central and eastern section of the building were highly disturbed by illegal excavations. The presence of early second millennium BC in the Luther's pits dictate that we are looking at perhaps one of the earliest hilltop storm god temples, parallels that we know from much later Hittite contexts. Here the wind blows strong, the sun sets in a theatrical fashion, and Kazukaya massive dominate the landscape, creating an ideal location for creating bonds with the celestial world. The dating of this structure to early second millennium BC may perhaps signal how the cult of storm god was evolved in climatically stressed time periods, further emphasizing the bounded relationship between climate and social behaviors. From settlement shifts to long distance mobility patterns as social reflections, reflections of climate change, the region has now been under intensive investigation from the perspective of geoarchaeological research through recently awarded Turkish National Science Foundation project. Our new sedimentary coring program included data collection from all around the sites discussed in this talk. This all started at Toprakisar, where explorations began with the use of a marine coring platform in the Yarseli Dam, thanks to Ula Shavshar. Further continued between Telachana, Tel Tainat, Tel Kurdu, and the drained Amuk, Amuk Lake to reveal crucial information regarding polyacclimate and polyenvironment during the Holocene. This project included the extremely difficult task of acquiring undisturbed sediment cores, where we successfully extracted cores varied from 10 to 21 meters in different locations. The extracted cores were cut, documented, packed, and transferred to Middle East Technical University for further geochemical analysis. The micro scale understanding of climate change through stratigraphical data sets and through high resolution coring strategies can be defined as one of the most ambitious projects of its kind. In this first part of our presentation, I jumped from one side to another, just like the Alalakians moving from one proxy to another in the past, performing tasks from agriculture to ritual activities. Hope you enjoyed this intro and stay tuned for Tara Igman exploring regional and interregional mobility patterns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murat, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I, before I move on to Tara, I just want to um, say how impressed uh, I am by just the sheer amount of um, research that you've been doing uh, in the Valley. Not only do you do the survey, uh, and uh, have you been investigating Kazulkaya? Uh, but uh, Toprakisar on its own is a major project, and you're, uh, you know, directing one of the uh, most uh, well-known Middle and Late Bronze Bronze Age sites. So there's there's a lot of um, things that uh, you know. I just wonder about the amount of time that this kind of uh, research would take. There's 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 so much involved, and and how you coordinate all this different these different aspects, and how uh, is it possible to you know? It's obviously very nicely integrated, but uh, you know the coordination uh, is something that I myself uh, wonder. Uh, you know, as um, I also struggle with these kind of things, and I think you're doing such a, an amazing job. Could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh yes, definitely. Uh, I would say uh, the the most important uh, reason behind this is because we are based in Hatay, so that's why we can do multiple projects and extending uh, the field work uh, for almost up to five six months. 
uh, because like uh, whenever I have to teach, I can go teaching uh, from where we are based now. So this is one thing. But of course, uh, it's not just about like uh, going from one project to another, but what we are trying to do here is also uh, to catch up with the publication process. So uh, all these materials presented uh, in this presentation are already published. And, and that's what we are very keen on as uh, all together as a project itself, let's say. Yeah, very, very impressive. Uh, and if you don't mind, I ask, I'd like to ask just one more question. Um, those, um, uh, those hearths with decorations that you showed um, really in sort of, in my mind, reminded me of the, the early Bronze Age uh, hearths. And, and I know that Toprakisar has these levels, as you mentioned. Uh, and um, I'd like to know the whether there is any kind of continuity. You're saying that this doesn't exist uh, for uh, the Achana uh, region, uh, but whether there is continuity and whether you can sort of give a, just a few um, sentences perhaps about, um, you know, at least the, the late Calcolithic, which I know you've done some research on and on the, the late bronze at uh, Toprakisar as well. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, as you mentioned, there's a continuity from the early bronze age to middle bronze age in the sense of hearts. And uh, this is actually what we are not seeing uh, in the case of uh, the relationship between Tainat and Achana. There seems to be like a particular time period that is missing. And that's what we are getting right now at, at, at Toprakisar. Uh, so uh, your question uh, will have more answers actually when we are exploring uh, the early Bronze Age, the early Bronze Age levels at Toprakisar, which is actually, which was the project's goals for the last two years. So now uh, underneath this Middle Bronze Age building, we now have another building complex dated to end of early Bronze Age. And that's another spectacular building, which uh, I didn't show here. And I uh, wanted to keep it because in December, there will be another talk uh, on the early Bronze Age of Amuk. Uh, as part of the Columbia seminars that uh, Alstan Ojam is organizing. So I'm keeping that bit for that part. And the questions uh, or your answers will be in that lecture, I would say. And for the calculatic part, uh, especially when you go to the lower skirts of Toprekisar, you see that everywhere it's chaff face there. Uh, so, and that's uh, very exciting because we don't really have any late calculatic properly explored in the Amok. And that's one of the key time periods that we need to explore. And I have a feeling that in the coming years, uh, we may get a chance to get more into this uh, mysterious time periods from the Amok again at Toprakisa. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's something that we, we really need to have data on because it's uh, distinct from uh, what we expect other places, I think, uh, with regards to the ceramics and hopefully we'll see the material culture and other aspects as well. Thank so you. Uh, thank you. And I hope the people in the audience stay tuned for this talk that uh, uh, Murat just mentioned that will be coming up uh, in, later on in a few months uh, on the early Bronze Age. Uh, and with that, I'd like to invite our second speaker, Tara, uh, to the stage, uh, and maybe I'll wait as you uh, try to see whether you can project your slides. Um, actually, I wanted to give a short intro about the project before I okay. share my screen, if that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, please do. Oh, I'm just going to turn my camera off, but I'll have my volume on just to, so that when you do do your slides, I can see what it is. Yeah. Sure, great, thank you. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, about the kind of overall project before I get into some of the results that we've gotten so far. This is a, a long-term collaborative project that's been ongoing for the last several years that focuses on mobility, as Murat said. Um, and as I hope you got a sense of from his talk, there are high levels of internationalism evident at Telechana. And both material and textual evidence suggests that there was a lot of movement, not just of goods like pottery and agricultural products, but also of people, of course, who were moving these things around. So because of this high degree of connectivity, we designed a research project to investigate whether we could identify foreigners at Achana among the people who were buried at the site. And for this, we partnered with the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, which is located in Jena, Germany. 
and as part of two much larger research projects, conducted targeted ancient DNA and isotope sampling of the burials at the site. The DNA analysis is part of the MOM project, which is a collaboration between Max Planck and Harvard called the Max Planck Harvard Research Center for the Archaeoscience of the Ancient Mediterranean. And that focuses on the Bronze and Iron Ages and looks at the DNA of both humans and pathogens from all around the Eastern Mediterranean to understand how people and groups were moving during this period. The isotope analysis, which actually was the subject of my dissertation, is part of a large re European Research Council project called Food Transforms, which looks at food and diet in the second millennium BC all across the Eastern Mediterranean. So through our partnership with these projects, the analyses on the Achana individuals were conducted both in Yena and South Africa at Cape Town University's Isotopes Lab. So I wanna say at the top that the results I'm presenting here are the results of the work of many people from many places around the world, especially the DNA results. So with that, let me share my screen. Is that... Yep, yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So Achana is a wonderful case study for this type of research on the mobility of Bronze Age individuals because of the high number of graves that have been found there. There are 343 in total, which is a very large number compared to many other contemporary sites in the region. The original woolly excavations that Murat mentioned found many graves and nearly 200 have been found in the renewed excavations as well. The map here of the site shows the squares where graves have been found and you can see that they're spread all across the site. And so we sampled individuals from all of these areas as well as the various contexts where they've been found in order to get a cross section of the population. So currently we have isotopic results from 104 individuals, including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and strontium, though I'm only going to talk about the strontium here today, for which we have 53 individuals. We also have DNA results from 37 individuals, which although it may not sound like a lot is actually a very high number from a single site, <clears throat> especially from this area and period. So because of both the multiple methods used and the large sample size, this is really a unique study for the ancient Near East that has allowed us to look at many individuals in great detail and reconstruct parts of their life histories. So for those of you who may not be familiar with strontium isotope studies, I'll just give a brief background on the method. Strontium isotopes are used in archaeology primarily for mobility studies which look at patterns like migration, transhumance, exogamy practices, things like this. The method depends on determining a local isotopic signature and then comparing the human results to this local range. So as you can see illustrated here, strontium signatures are derived from bedrock values, which are geologically dependent. Strontium originates in the bedrock and moves through the food chain entering the human body via plants and animals and substituting for calcium during bone and tooth formation. So areas with different geologies therefore result in different strontium signatures. Another important thing to keep in mind when interpreting strontium isotope results is what material was sampled. So here we sampled tooth enamel because it forms in childhood and doesn't remodel meaning that the results indicate where a person lived in their childhood, although the precise age depends on which tooth is sampled. We chose to sample second molars, which form between the ages of around two and eight. So the strontium analyses detect whether an individual grew up locally at Achana or moved there later, while the genetic data can be used to determine where a person's recent ancestors came from. So the two analyses operate on different scales and give different, though hopefully complementary information. In order to interpret the strontium results though, we need to understand what the local strontium values are, which of course means taking samples. In archeology, span strontium isotope studies use a variety of sample types for this, although animal bones and teeth are, I would say the most widely used. You can see from this map that there's a wide range of geological formations in and around the valley. And we wanted to get local baselines, both for the Amuk Valley as a whole, 
and Teletrana specifically, so that we could get an idea of what this variation looked like. For Achana itself, we used 35 faunal samples from excavated contexts, but for the valley, we didn't have archaeological samples, and so we used modern snail shells, which are very easy to find in many areas. We analyzed 14 shells from around the valley, and you can see the locations on the map. So the results from those modern and ancient environmental samples are shown here in black and gray on the right side of the graph. In order to calculate a local range, strontium studies typically take the mean of these environmental samples and then add and subtract two standard deviations. Because we have samples, as I said, from both Achana specifically and from the valley generally, we were able to calculate two local ranges, one for Achana, which is calculated from the archaeological samples and is shown here in blue, and one for the Amuk as a whole, which is calculated from the modern samples and is shown here in orange. So when we compare these ranges to the results from the humans, 40 individuals plot inside the range of Alalak, meaning they likely both grew up and died in the city. And another eight plot within the range for the Amuk Valley, but outside of the Achana range, meaning they probably grew up outside of the city itself, but somewhere else within the valley. Five individuals are identified as non-locals to both Alalak and the Amuk, plotting outside of both local ranges. Interestingly, two of these five are secondary burials, which you see highlighted here in the yellow section, kind of in the middle of the graph. Secondary burial is an interesting tradition where the remains of people are retrieved from their primary burial place and are later reburied, usually in a different location. And this tradition is present at Achana, but it makes up a minority of the burials at the site. Even more interesting is the fact that two of the individuals who likely came from within the Amuk Valley rather than Alalak itself are also secondary burials, with only one of the sampled secondary burials falling within the local range for Alalak. In fact, three of the individuals sampled here are from the same burial, which consisted of three mandibles buried in a group. So one of the three was a non-local, and the other two were from the Amuk, although probably not from the same location because their isotopic results are fairly separated. So this demonstrates that all three spent their childhoods in different places, despite ending up being buried together. We also wanted to look in more detail at the non-locals though, and see if we could determine the timing of their migration to Alalak. So for this, we also analyzed third molars from several individuals, and these form in kind of later childhood and adolescence. And so they give a picture from somewhat later in life than the second molars. So we saw several patterns come out of these results. One individual sample number ALA 110, this is the, the one that's circled all the way to the left of the graph, has a second molar that yielded the lowest value among the entire group. But the third molar is near the mean for Alalak which indicates that this person moved to the city in kind of their later childhood between the formation of the second and third molars, probably around the ages of seven, eight, nine, something like that. Another individual, Ala 98, which is the middle one circled here, kind of down at the bottom, yielded very similar values for both teeth. So it seems that this individual spent their entire childhood and youth in another location and then moved to Alalak later, probably as an adult. The rightmost circled individual, which is Ala 48, apparently came from the Amuk, though not Achana, but seems to have moved to Alalak maybe during their adolescence, while the third molar was still in the process of forming, since the third molar falls just outside the range for Alalak. So if we turn then to the DNA results, we see that all of the individuals sampled from Achana, which are indicated with the green circles here, are very homogeneous from a population genomics perspective, with only one exception, who is circled in blue towards the top of the graph, and that I'll talk about shortly. The rest of the individuals cluster together kind of in the center of this principal components analysis, this PCA, and they group closely together with individuals buried at the nearby city of Ebla, located in modern Syria, 
And those are the ones uh, represented by yellow circles that you see kind of within that blue circled area in the middle there. So both of these groups fall between contemporary Central Anatolian and Central and Southern Levantine individuals. And models of the Alalak individuals describe their ancestry as a combination of Anatolian, Levantine, and Iranian or Caucasian origins. The genetic homogeneity of the Ashana samples suggests that the recent ancestors of most people came from within this kind of wider region around the Amuk and Ebla. If we look at the genetic data for the five non-locals that I just said were identified by strontium isotopes, the three for whom we have DNA results all share the same genetic profile as the others. So despite being migrants to the site, which again, we identified through strontium isotopes, they look local from a DNA perspective. And there are a couple of possible explanations for this. They could have come to Alalak from outside the Amuk, but still within this wider Alalak, Ebla, kind of Northwestern Syria, Southeastern Anatolia region, maybe from Ebla itself or from the lands around it, for example. Another possibility is backwards migration or return migration meaning that their parents or their grandparents could have moved away from the Amuk, and then they later returned to their parents' home at some point in their lives. As I said, there's one outstanding case of long distance mobility among the DNA results, the outlier that we pointed out in the previous slide. She has been dubbed the well lady because her remains were found at the bottom of a well, and she potentially was a victim of murder. As I said, she occupies an extreme outlier position in the PCA, as we just saw. And her, the position that she has there is closest to sampled individuals from Bronze Age Iran and Central Asia. So it's clear that either she or her recent ancestors migrated to the Achana region. And when we look at the strontium isotope data, it helps us narrow down the possibilities. You see her results circled and highlighted here. So we sampled all three of her molars, the first, second, and third molars. And it seems from these results that the well lady herself didn't migrate, since all three molars fall very close to the Achana mean and well within the local range for Alalak. So the strontium evidence is consistent with her having spent her entire life at Achana, despite her very different DNA profile. So looking at these different data sets together, we were able to better understand how people at Alalak moved across the landscape. Importantly, we detected and defined multiple types of mobility. So long distance migrants, like the ancestors probably of the well lady, who likely came from kind of Iran, Central Asia area. This type of migration was apparently rather rare, at least based on the data that we have available. Regional migration from the larger Amuk Ebla area was apparently more common, and it's represented in our data set by those non locals identified through strontium, but whose genetic profiles match those of the local inhabitants. Given the relatively low numbers of non locals identified by strontium, this type of migration was also apparently not extremely common, though more so than long distance migration. Short distance or even perhaps micro regional migration is also detectable since we were able to distinguish a local range for Achana versus one for the Amuk, as I discussed. This type of migration was more common than the others, unsurprisingly, and relatively higher numbers of individuals came to Alalak from other places in the Amuk. There are also several possible cases of return or backwards migration, as I mentioned, where descendants of migrants may have moved back to their ancestors' homeland. So to circle back to one of our main research questions that I mentioned at the beginning, despite the high levels of mobility that are documented both textually and archeologically, it seems that relatively few individuals were buried away from the places where they grew up. This, of course, doesn't rule out travel and movement by adults, which wouldn't be detectable by the methods we've used here. But it suggests that individual mobility was mainly restricted to adulthood and that people were generally buried close to their childhood homes. So that's kind of a summary of some of the bioarchaeological work we've been doing in the region. Um, and let me stop sharing my screen. There we go.
sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. It's uh, uh, really amazing to see the DNA data and the strontium data and these different um, relationships. Um, I have a question, actually, if you don't mind, about these uh, non, um, well, I mean, these, these burials that are secondary. Uh, are these burials, I mean, they're different in terms of their, their, their coming here, but it's kind of gives me the idea that uh, a secondary burial in some cases might be that, you know, they died elsewhere and you wanted to then move uh, the, you know, the bones because these people came there to Achana at a certain age at 10 or something like this. So that would be their homeland potentially. Uh, but it's interesting statistically, is there some sort of ethnic you know, secondary burial thing that, uh, you know, has to do with where they come from? Or, I mean, can you elaborate on that? Because it's very sort of an interesting question and dilemma. Yeah, sure. I agree. Thank you. It is very interesting. Um, and as you know, <laughs> kind of the the relationship between ethnicity and burial traditions uh, was a major topic of my dissertation. So it's yeah. something that I'm also very interested in, as you know. Um, and yeah, there are multiple possibilities, right, for how these people or these people's mandibles, in some cases, mm -hmm. ended up at Achana. Um, one of them is that, you know, kind of the most straightforward explanation, right? They grew up somewhere else. They came to Achana as adults or, you know, later in their lives or whatnot, whatever the case may be. They died there. They were buried there. And we found a mandible. Um, and if that's the case, then yeah, that does kind of suggest, as you said, that secondary burial was maybe a stronger tradition in the areas where they came from than it necessarily was at Achana. Mm -hmm. If we look, if you kind of zoom out, um, secondary burial is something, it is a, a tradition that pops up um, for a really long time, you know, that as far back as kind of the fifth, sixth millennium in the Southern Levant, at least. Um, all up and down the Levant, you see a minority of burials being treated secondarily mm -hmm. for many, many millennia. Um, so yeah, it could be, it could be something like this. It could have been more of a tradition wherever they originally came from. Right. But as you point out, it could also be that they have only, you know, their relatives or whoever after their death brought mm -hmm. this mandible or whatnot, specifically for burial at Alalak. And the rest of their remains were buried somewhere else or they were cremated or, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and Alalak as this kind of, you know, regional center, capital city, regional cult center also, we know it was an important cult center. Mm -hmm. That could have been a draw for people to come and bury parts of their relatives there. You know, this is completely speculative, but we can imagine that perhaps the ritual expert at all of the regional, uh, you know, the, the, the head priest of Ishtar or whoever was supposed to be buried at Alalak or have a piece of him buried at Alalak, for example. And so, you know, they brought the mandible from here and there. And, you know, this, I'm not saying that that is what happened, but I'm saying that that type of a scenario could also be possible. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, I see we're kind of running short on time. So I, I think it's yeah. probably a good idea to, to move on now, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, with uh, Ulash. Uh, so would you wish to share your screen right away? Yes. So I will be quick then. Oh, well, no, you do have a half hour. And, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, oh no, but that's including questions. I mean, we, we have a half an hour. It's, it, it, okay. please, you can do it in 20 minutes. Uh, thanks. Okay, so uh, I think you can see my screen. Yes, I can see your screen, yeah. Okay, make it full screen, so. Uh, I think this is the time to talk about uh, sediment coring uh, and our project uh, in Amico Valley. Uh, Murat already gave some uh, introductory information about this project. 
but uh, I will give more detailed information. Uh, the, it is a Tubitak project, uh, by the way, 1001. Uh, and the title is Geological and Archaeological Trace of Climatic Change in Amut Valley during the Holocene. So we have, uh, I'm the PI of the uh, project, and we have several uh, researchers, Murat Akar, Fatmut of Turkestan, Nurban Yavuz, and Angelia Pishkin. And we also have some consultants from uh, Liège University from Belgium, Aurelia Hubert Ferrari, and also Charlotte Pearson from uh, Arizona State uh, University. So before this talk, um, Murat especially insisted on uh, that I need to uh, prepare my talk uh, in order to better emphasize what is the difference of our project from uh, previous uh, class, let's say classical paleoclimatic research. So uh, I designed my talk uh, in order to uh, explain what is the difference of our uh, project. So firstly, I will only talk about the motivation behind this project and then I will uh, briefly uh, show the results of previous works uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And uh, the third part is the most important part, uh, I think, and I really want to emphasize the importance of sampling or coring methods, because I know uh, many archaeologists uh, in the archaeology sites, archaeological sites, uh, people want to collect uh, sediment cores, but uh, as being a geologist, uh, which is an expert on uh, coring and drilling. Uh, I need to give, uh, I want to give detailed information what would be the uh, proper coring methods for archaeological sites. And finally, I will give uh, brief information about current progress and preliminary results of our uh, project. First of all, the research question was at the beginning, uh, did paleoclimatic change obtained from geological archives really affected human lives or activities? This is a very important question for us at the beginning of the project. Uh, and the second project, uh, second question uh, was, uh, can we uh, find traces of human activities in the sedimentary sequences of mounds? First of all, in a geological perspective, I first want to explain uh, the geological setting of Amuk Valley. It's quite important for uh, many archaeologists, I guess, this will contain the answer why we are uh, so excited to work in Amuk Valley. So in geology, we have, in geography uh, also, we have meandering rivers like this. And uh, during summer and autumn, this meandering river flows quite uh, slowly, and you have some soil shape of it. But in winter and in spring, you are going to have flooding like this. Normally, the water is flowing in this uh, channel, but during the flood, the water comes out and it brings some sediment with itself from the channel towards the distal parts of the channel. So in the end, it leaves some sediment next to the river. And next year, next flood, the same thing happens. And then it leaves sediments around uh, the channel. So, because of the continuous accumulation here, if you collect samples or pores from the sedimentary sequences, if you, if you investigate them centimeter by centimeter, you're going to follow the environmental or climatic change through the history. So Amik Valley or uh, Tel Achana or Tel uh, Tainat is really nice, nice example for this. As you see here, we have Tel Achana here, Tel Tainat, and you can see the meandering Orontes River. So all of this part, all of this land around the mounds, in fact, are flat plain deposits. So there is continuous recording sedimentology, recording sedimentation, so that when you study those sediments, you can construct a history of the region. So Amic Valley is quite important. These mounds are quite important since they have floodplain deposits around them. Another advantage, uh, here we have a lake in this plain. Uh, here we have Achana and Tainat mounds. Here we have Kurdu mounds, the other uh, mounds. We uh, also collect cores around it. And also we have the ancient, this is the boundary 
of ancient um, lake. So we also want to investigate the sedimentary record or sedimentary sequence of the lake. So they easily, they typically record paleoenvironmental or paleoclimatic chains. So our project focused on uh, lots of cores from the Amit Lake and also cores around Achanatayna and Kurdumaus. So this is an illustration of uh, probably we can illustrate uh, Amic plain like this. We have mounds, people uh, doing agriculture on the mounds, and here we have floodplain deposits. Is here Orontes River, Amic Lake, and Toprekisar Lake. We have two lakes and floodplain deposits, and we of course have lots of archaeological information. So Amic Plain, Amic Valley is. I think the perfect place to uh, work on geoarchaeology and uh, paleoclimatic records, uh, whether they affected uh, human life and activities or not. Let me give some brief information about previous works here. In this map, you can see white dots. All of them are paleoclimatic records obtained in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Now I will show you the, the records. These are all proxy records. And I plotted them in this figure uh, so that the left hand side of the graphs are drier periods. Uh, of course, we are not going to talk too much about this figure, but I want to emphasize, I want to take your attention to this event, for example. In this record, this event around this time, it says it, uh, it was drier, but the other event, the other uh, site, other study says it was wetter. Okay, so there, there is discrepancy between, there's lots of discrepancy between paleoclimatic records obtained in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we try to improve this uh, discrepancies in our project. These discrepancies can be because of proxy methods already have complexities. So as you see here, there are different proxies. For example, oxygen isotope they used, carbon isotope they used. So these are in fact significant interpretations about uh, paleoclimate. So they are estimations in fact. Uh, I will talk about this, how we try to improve ourselves, our project in order to avoid these complexities. And sometimes some studies have really few dates, few radiocarbon dates, and the chronology may not be quite good. For example, uh, let's see, for example, this event has 3.2 Ka, but here another study from Amit Lake, uh, he, it has 3.2, but probably because of few radiocarbon dates, they do not match. And finally, the main thing about uh, our project is core quality, coring quality. So I want to really emphasize about the methods about this. So before I met Murat, uh, before I start to work with archaeologists, in fact, uh, I was living on lakes or in the, the sea environment with my platform like this. In the water, we were collecting cores, like see, you see in this animation, we have the platform, we anchor it to the bottom and we lower our system to the bottom and we have piston within this PVC pipe and we were simply hammering it into the sediments. Since we have, during the, uh, during the hammering, since we have a piston here within the PVC pipe, we created uh, equal vacuum in the line and so that we could take undisturbed sedimentary sequence at the bottom from the bottom of the sea. Here, uh, it, may be, it may seem quite technical detail, but I need to really say this. Uh, piston, usage of piston is quite important here. If you do not use a piston, as you hammer your system into the sediments because of the internal friction here, it will push the sediment towards the bottom. So in the end, your sediments in your core are going to be 
disturbed or you will lose some parts of your sedimentary sequence. So you may misunderstand or you may misinterpret these losses or deformations uh, as paleoclimatic change. So use of piston in uh, piston quarry was quite, is still quite important. But in Amic Valley, in Amic Plain, we needed to decide which coring method we need to use. So one by one, I will explain uh, why we use piston coring. For example, standard penetration test is a very commonly used uh, method uh, to collect samples. With a drilling rig like this, you just hammer and you have a standard tube at the bottom. And during each hammering, you're going to have penetration into the sediments. But in this method, the sampling length is just 50 centimeter and we do not use piston here. So we will have this problem. So we eliminated standard penetration test method for Amit Valley. Another method is undisturbed shall be tube method. Again, you use a drilling rig and you just push your tube into the sediments continuously with a hydraulic power. But again, with this, with, uh, with this method, the problem is sampling length is quite short. And since it does not use piston, again, we have this kind of disturbance. So we eliminated, we canceled this option as well. Another uh, important sampling pouring method is vibro pouring. Basically with a drilling rig, you uh, vibrate your pipe with a high frequency and it uh, liquefies the sand and it penetrates into the sediments. However, uh, you can uh, take several meters of core with this method, but it is only used for pure sand. Uh, your sediments should be like beach sands. Uh, otherwise, if you have some clay or silt, finer uh, material, this uh, coring uh, operation will stop. So we eliminated this as well because in Amuk Valley we have, we already know that the sediments are silty clay. We do not have pure sand. The most commonly used one uh, is rotary double tube pouring. Uh, most people use this one, uh, but it has also this advantage. So you have a double tube like this, and uh, the water is uh, pumped into the pipes and between this uh, space from between inner and outer tubes, water comes at the tip, but it goes up. And in this way, you can take the drilled material out and your sediment is going to be, your core is going to be in this inner tube. You can take maximum 1.5 meters, uh, of course, with this method, but the problem is it dissolves soft clays and sands. During this rotation, uh, it is pushed into the sediments with a rotation and water circulation. So this water circulation dissolves soft clays in the sediments and sands are lost. So this is a disadvantage, so we also eliminate this option as well. Piston coring that we use uh, in lake sediments or in uh, marine sediments, uh, okay, it does not lose sediments. Uh, it does not disturb the sediments. Uh, you can collect five to six meters long cores. These are good advantages, but this system is designed uh, only for very soft sediments and it also requires water. So we needed to uh, modify our piston coring system in order to collect cores uh, from Amicua. So in the end, imagine that you have this kind of sedimentary sequence. You have sand, clay, sand, clay, gravel, pebble, clay, sand, clay. Most of the time, nature is like this. So you need to find a single method to collect all of these types of sediments in one shot of single uh, coring. So all other methods cannot do this, but piston coring, if you strengthen your material, we were able to collect this kind of cores. Normally piston core, we had uh, in the lakes, we had 10 to 12 kilograms of hammer uh, weight, but uh, in Tamuk we used 55 kilograms and also we used drilling rig to push all of, this, all of the system into the sediment. So we applied much, much more 
power on our coring system. So we used, we were using PVC pipes and we started to use aluminum pipes in order to increase the strength of our coring uh, liner. And also at the tip of our uh, corer, we were using brass core catcher, but we started to use chrome core catcher like this. So in this way, we strengthen our uh, system in order to collect cores from Amic Valley. In order to use, uh, instead of using our coring platform, we used drilling rig like this, and it's quite really powerful drilling rig, but even sometimes its power was not enough to push our pipes into the sediments and we were helping the machine, we were helping the drilling rig uh, to penetrate our pipes into the sediments. So it was quite difficult, uh, but in the end we were successful. I will show you some examples uh, from Toprakistar and Amit Lake uh, in order to prove that the sediment cores, the cores we collected are uh, quite undisturbed. So these are the coring locations around Toprakistar Mount. And let's see some photographs. Here we have seven cores. The cores can be correlatable stratigraphically. And if you look at this part of the core, here we have a close up view. And as you, you can easily see that horizontal and almost flat bedding we have or layers we have. In nature, normally sediments are uh, deposited horizontal and flat. If you do not see they're flat, it means that they're disturbed. So for this part, for example, you can easily see the success of piston coring. Uh, you almost see, uh, you see the layers almost flat and parallel. Here, for example, again, very nice flat and horizontal layers. This one is a little bit disturbed. This part is really chaotic. And this part it starts to be normal again. So this part, maybe it's too much information, but these sediments are deformed because of, the, because of an earthquake uh, on the Dead Sea Fault. Uh, during the shaking of the earthquake, these sediments are disturbed and they're deformed. It's a very nice example of uh, Lacustrian Paleoseismology. At the same time, we have clay or silty clay material. At the bottom of the course, we started to have gravel, sand, and pebbles, even pebbles. This was really uh, important for us because it, it proves that we can collect uh, silt and clay, and we can also collect pebble material uh, with our coring system. So these two photographs are really important. They are from the same core. This is at the upper part. And two meters below this part, you see the pebbles. Okay. So this is, an, in fact, incredible success, I can say. So we currently now can collect undisturbed sediment cores. So the next step was start to start our project. So in our project, uh, as I already showed you along this line, we collected many, many cores, undisturbed sediment cores, and also around Achana and Tainat, we collected cores at these locations, all around Achana, and two cores from Tainat, and also around Kurdu, Mount Tal Kurdu, we collected two cores at these points. So we tried to cover floodplain deposits around the mounts, all of these cores are for floodplain deposits. And also we used the two lakes, Toprakisar and also uh, Amik, uh, Amik Lake. In the end, we collected 20 cores and the longest is about uh, 19 meters. And in total, we collected 206.2 meters of core from Amik Valley, undisturbed cores from uh, Amik Valley. So I explained how we improved the core quality. We improved also dating problem. We have lots of budget for radiocarbon dating and also proxy methods will be improved in this project because here, that is why we collected cores all along this line because we are going to check the real geometry of the lake through time. We are not going to trust only proxy records. Here, we are going to try to understand 
at which periods this lake, amic lake, got smaller and it got bigger. If we are talking about droughts like 3.2, 4.2, amic lake should get should have got uh, smaller. So we are going to see its sedimentary traces all along this course. So in this way, we improve our uh, approach uh, for the proxy records. We improved our radiocarbon dating numbers, and also we improved our pouring quality. So uh, I guess this is the special part of our uh, project. I will show you again uh, some core photographs from Amit Lake all along this uh, line. We have 11 cores. You can see photographs of them. But you cannot see, of course, because uh, this is true to scale. Uh, I need to switch to Photoshop uh, part. So here we have uh, 11 cores. If we zoom in to the deeper parts of the longest pore, which is around 19 meters, you can see, for example, a nice flood event here. And here is the close up view of this event, of this event. As you see, we have very nice bottom. It's almost horizontal flat. And you can see even very tiny layering, which are almost horizontal and uh, undisturbed, even at 18 or 19 meters depth. So this is also, uh, this made us also very happy that uh, we could collect undisturbed cores. So let's move to our, uh, presentation. So uh, what we are going to do with these uh, sediment cores, first of all, radiocarbon dating will be done. We measure magnetic susceptibility in order to understand the physical parameters uh, all along the sediments. Uh, we are measuring, we are doing lots of geochemical measurements, uh, for example, eye tracks, micro XRF scanning. Uh, we scan, we make measurements at every two millimeters all along these cores. This is an extremely high resolution. And also we do ICPMS and OES measurements. These are very precise geochemical measurements so that we obtain uh, information about the uh, elemental concentrations in the sediments. We also work on mineralogy of the sediments uh, in the region because clay minerals uh, give some responses to climate change. If you have uh, wet and mild uh, conditions, you're going to create more, uh, some chemical weathering products of uh, clay minerals. But if you have cold and dry uh, periods, you're going to create, uh, produce another type of minerals. So mineralogy is also on, in our scope. We also work palynology. We also work on uh, pollens all, all in these cores. And we also work on paleobotanical remains all along these course because we want to understand what kind of remains people left, uh, especially uh, in the course in the sediments around the mounds. So uh, the project is quite a multidisciplinary uh, project in terms of its uh, variable types of data. Uh, I will show just uh, some measurements. These are magnetic susceptibility measurements at every five millimeters uh, along the course around Tel Achana, for example, uh, 81, 82, 83, they can be easily be correlatable with each other. This means that coring was successful and these sediments were similar. So nature is also successful to uh, measure or record the climate change or paleoenvironmental change. But 84 and 85 are some different uh, worlds. Why? Because 84 and 85 are at the Orontes River side, but one, two, three are at the other side. They're less undisturbed, less disturbed uh, around Tachana. So these are Kurdu cores. Again, susceptibility measurements on Kurdu cores. Also, we have here you can see. Taina three corps. These are all magnetic three corps, and you can correlate uh, different corps with each other. And these are the Amic Lake cores. All along the course, you can correlate, but at some points around the 
outer cores, you're going to see missing parts in the sediments when the lake got smaller and that parts, the outer parts are were dry. So detailed stratigraphical correlation will give us uh, information about the uh, dry periods. Uh, this is an uh, example from uh, ITRAX data from Toprakisar core. Uh, I just show you this because you need to have, you may want to have some idea what kind of data these are. You can see lots of elements, elemental profiles have been measured at two millimeters in, uh, in resolution. This is ICPMS results for Toprakisar, Toprakisar uh, core. Uh, we have almost 40 elements measured all along the cores. Uh, but in the end, I just want to briefly explain why and how we can uh, interpret uh, the elemental measurements, uh, elemental measurements along this. Uh, sedimentary cores. So imagine that we have a core here. During the flood, it brings representative element titanium, for example. While it's getting dry after the flood, it gives calcium representative element of evaporation. During the next flood, it again brings titanium. And during drying, you're going to have more calcium in your sediments because of evaporation. So if you have dry periods, for example, you will expect to have high calcium values. So all along the core, if you divide calcium uh, values to titanium values, you're going to have anomalies like this where calcium is excessive. So it means that all of these anomalies can be interpreted as dry periods. So it's, it's not, of course, this much simple, but the interpretations, uh, paleoclimatic or paleoenvironmental interpretations are done in a similar way for other elements or for other proxies. So that's all I can say. Uh, I'm sure I, I left many parts out. If you have uh, questions, I can happily answer all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ulash. Uh, I uh, particularly enjoyed, I learned so much. So thank you for this talk. Uh, I was going to ask you a question about, um, you know, what kind of other information you can get uh, uh, from doing cores other than climate, but I already found out that uh, earthquakes are one of them. And it didn't surprise me given your interest in earthquakes from before. Uh, yes. <laughs> so let me ask you about earthquakes. So this earthquake, you were able to then see across all the different um, levels, uh, I'm assuming, of uh, or uh, across, you know, different cores that you took, at least for Toprakisar, where you noticed it, I'm sure, I'm hoping, uh, because that would then tie in and, and maybe you can elaborate on that. And I'll ask a second question, just because we're running out of time. And that's this amazing methodology with all these pistons and you modified it. Did you come up with this yourself? Or did, is it something that uh, someone else has like done? I mean, this, maybe you can elaborate on that as well, briefly. Yeah, it, it was uh, uh, my family. My father had a drilling company, so I have uh, lots of uh, experience on uh, drilling and pouring and uh, sampling. But later on in the academy, I uh, improved uh, the piston pouring system in the lakes and uh, in seas. But later on, of course, someone should ask you uh, that uh, at this point we need to pour so that you can improve yourself. Uh, yes. Finally, Murat asked. Uh, let's take course from here and together we modified uh, the system and finally it worked. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so in addition to earthquakes, uh, could you say that, um, you know, there's other information, climate and earthquakes and what else uh, does, the, does the coring give us? Could you maybe elaborate on that just briefly? In the, uh, other than other than climatic change or earthquakes, we cannot get that much information about uh, sediments, but uh, from sediments, but uh, maybe we are going to uh, we are going to find new drought periods. Everyone is talking about 3.2, 4.2, but maybe there's 5.6. Uh. Uh, so we are confident that our cores are complete and they are uh. undisturbed so that maybe we are going to recognize a climatic event 
that have not been recognized before in the region. I see. So uh, this is quite uh, exciting for us. Murat, maybe you want May to I interfere here? This yes, sure. Yeah. Like, of course, uh, Ulash is on, not only, but he is more enthusiastic oh. about looking at this from the geological perspective. But obviously, yeah. we want to find a few shirts that can give us an <laughs> idea about, like, at least the expansion of uh, cities and how they are related to each other, which is uh, something that we are also like willing to see in the course, let's say. Mm, I see. Um, I have actually a, a, a question for Tara. We have very little time, but uh, just allow me to ask it. I'm, it's amazing. You've done, it seems like you've done everything possible uh, with all the different analyses. Are there new directions that you wish to pursue with the future research? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So um, the next step of this research that we are in the process of planning and organizing um, is to take, because a few individuals have been excavated at Toprak Usar. So to also do a similar, much smaller scale, because there are only a handful of them, but uh, similar analyses and similar uh, project with them and kind of then integrate them into, you know, late third, second millennium Amuk people as a whole, you know, and compare the Achana and the Toprakasar folks. Yeah, uh, that would be amazing. And that would perhaps complement the mobility from a different perspective. And uh, I, I can see the value in that and uh, it should definitely be uh, approached in the same uh, fine grained matter. And that's what we're missing, I think, from a lot of archaeological research. We have science that have amazing data, but it doesn't seem to translate to another science. So that would be the perfect angle to, to proceed in. Um, there, uh, I don't see any questions from our audience, but maybe um, uh, is, if anybody wants to, we can have one question from the audience. So uh, anything else, uh, Murat, uh, that you would like to add to the talk, uh, your talk or to the general um, you know, presentations of others? Oh, uh, well, as, you, as we listened, uh, this, all, this, all of these projects are connected uh, one way or another to, to each other. So uh, hopefully, uh, whenever we produce on one aspect of these multiple projects, we're trying to integrate it to the other. Uh, for instance, for, uh, for the Kazukaya, uh, this is something that now we are working again for understanding why we have some sort of a hilltop uh, kind of, a, let's say, temple complex. And uh, with, again, with working with geologists now, we are thinking uh, about the possibility of uh, finding like uh, travertine sources that may uh, signal clues about like uh, springs related to that area. And in fact, this is another sort of mini projects that uh, we are working on. So, as I said, this is this is these all these projects are connected to each other, and hopefully uh, we will produce and share more in the like, coming uh, presentations. I hope so. We look forward to your upcoming presentation, and I'd like to thank you all uh, for these very informative uh, talks uh, and. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to, um, and we've run out of time, I'd like to say goodbye to everyone for tonight. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in another talk. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank goodbye. you.